Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Zantinetti, and we're here today, as usual, to bring the Word of God. And I want to thank God, especially for yesterday, the beginning of Hanukkah. This is the second day where the Jews are celebrating, or should celebrate, of course, the, the, the joy of the Second Temple being built. But as you know, we're in war right now, and so it's very difficult. But even in this time of war, we're to still celebrate God because he's so good. God is good, and his mercy endures forever. And may the Lord bless Jerusalem and his people, and may the Lord watch over them and give them strength and deliver them from their enemies. Well, we've been talking about many things this week, but today I want to share with you on a message which I call Rightly Clothed, Rightly Clothed. And it's pretty much, if you listen to yesterday's message, and uh, you're going to see how things just tie together, because we're talking about not just the assurance of salvation, we've been talking about salvation, period. And it's just wonderful. And uh, if you go back a few more videos, we've been talking about the holiness of God and our responsibility as Christians. There's so much to talk about. And that's why I thank God for Talk Straight Bible and others who are truly preaching the unadulterated word of God. There is no other way. But let's go on and talk about rightly clothed. You know, no one wants to walk into an important venue where there are important people and they're, they're talking about great things for the world and for people and business and all that, you know, whatever you walk into, you want to be rightly clothed. You want to look as uniform as you can concerning what you're walking into. Let's put it that way. I mean, I would not walk into a very important person's office whether it be the president, the governor, anyone. Not clothed with the, uh, the right apparel. And you know what I'm talking about. Okay. But I want to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Something happened there where God had to make clothes. Matter of fact, he's the first seam seamstress. He's the first... Uh, tailor of the Bible. Always will be. And it tells us here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, and God, the Lord God, Yahweh God, made coats of skin for the man and his wife and clothed them. And he clothed them. Now, there are other scriptures rolling up, as you can see, Romans chapter 5, verse Verse 1, it says, you know, uh, it comes to mind. Having therefore peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, or having been justified by peace, or with peace through the Lord Jesus Christ, we're standing right at the throne of God. Can you, can you imagine that? God has made us right with him. You know, because we have been declared righteous by Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Having been declared righteous, then by faith we have peace toward God and with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But then we have also in Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and there's a glorious proclamation there of what Paul tells us concerning the new man, as you know with me. And it's called the Ministry of Reconciliation, by the way, where he starts. But verse 17 down, it says, 
So that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. How that God was in Christ reconciling, that is, reuniting, bringing back the world back to himself, not reckoning to them their trespasses, and having put in us the word of reconciliation. In behalf of Christ, then we are ambassadors, as if God were calling through us, we implore, in behalf of Christ, be reconciled. In other words, very simple. He's telling us, now that we're ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ is beseeching, <laughs> begging the world to come back. How? Through Christ. He's beseeching through us. So we pray that even in Christ, you will be reconciled. And then, verse 21, and he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I'm going to turn real quickly also to chapter 15 of John. And this is where Jesus actually teaches something about the Father. But he's going way back to Genesis, you know. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, the husbandman. And every branch not bearing fruit in me, he takes away, and every one bearing fruit he cleanses by purging it, that it may bear more fruit. And look what he says now to the disciples. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself if it may not remain in the vine. So neither you, if you do not remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Something happened in Genesis, as we all know, from our first parents, Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. And it caused the fall of humanity. I, I want you to know that everything that you see today, right now, yesterday, tomorrow, everything that is evil, everything that is broken, all the trespasses, that means breaking the law, all the iniquity, that means our own perversions being manifested, all the sin, that means that we keep missing the mark no matter how much we try to shoot straight, it doesn't work. Everything that you see in the world today, every evil, every war, everything we see today is because Adam partook of the fruit with his wife and humanity fell. In other words, we can't even help ourselves. We can't be so perfect that we, we can't be touched. It's, it's, it's impossible. You and I sin every day because we want to many times, but because we have to. And it's not by our choice all the time. Having to meaning that there's the law of sin living in our members, and that law of sin fights against us. Fights against us. I asked the pastor one time, and I believe I shared with you, because we were talking about free will, and he was talking about, I can do whatever I want. We're free. We have a free will. I said, you can do whatever you want. He said, absolutely. I said, you have free will to do whatever you want. He said, yes. I said, I would like you to will never to sin again. And at this point, he said, I can't. I said, but you told me you got free will. If you could will never to sin again, then don't sin again. He said, I can't. I said, why? He says, because I'm a sinner. I said, so in other words, there's something inside of you and I that we say no to this, but we wind up doing it? Then how free is our will? How free are we that when we say no, something interrupts that and 
we wind up doing what we don't want to do. Paul the Apostle spoke about this in chapter 7, and you'll do right to read it, and how he elaborates and gives us an exposition of the scriptures and even of the law when he says that I have nothing live, you know, good living in my flesh except Christ. He says, you know, for the things that I, I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I want to do, I, I don't do. I wind up doing the opposite. He says, because of the law of sin that's living inside of me. He said, I delight in the law of God in my mind. I mean, I, I want to do God's will but I wind up doing my own will. And then he said, oh, the wretched man that I am. In other words, he realized I'm in a position where I can't even do this by myself. And at one point he says this, I didn't know what coveting was until I read in your word, in his law, you shall not covet. And all of a sudden, he said, everything that was desirous in me to cover it just sprang up and I died. In other words, God revealed what that truth was to him and he died. And I want to share something at the end of this because it is so important that Paul, like no one, Paul speaks about justification and peace and joy because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And how beautiful, how beautiful that salvation is. Please go back and listen to the video yesterday. It'll make so much even more sense today with this. We're talking about being rightly clothed. We're going to get there. And so Paul in chapter 7 is baffled because he understands something about sin like never before or teaching us about it and he says a wretched man i am who will deliver me out of the body of this death he says i thank god through jesus christ our lord so then i myself indeed serve the law of god with my mind and with my flesh the law of sin did you hear that there's two laws living inside of you and me Every Christian, remember, these two laws do not live in everyone, only inside of those who believe that Christ is Jesus. Why? Because the moment that you receive Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes into you, that divine heavenly law now abides in your spirit, but in your soul there is a law of sin and it keeps doing things and telling us to do things that we don't want to do and we wind up doing it. So with my body, my mind, oh, I want to serve you, God. You don't know sometimes throughout the days I'm just thinking about him. I say, God, I just want to serve you. I just want to be the man that you want me to be. But oh, what a wretched man I am. I keep, I keep falling. I keep messing up and I understand why. And that's why I also realize that no matter how many times I fall, he never looks at me as dirt. No, praise God for that. You know why? Because he have clothed me with his righteousness. And let me tell you what that means. I'm sure you have your own connotations about it. And that's good. We should. What is righteousness? Well, righteousness means straight up. Righteousness means to do what is right, but it means also to stay in a position that doesn't fall. The Bible says also in Romans 5 that I quoted, therefore having been justified through faith in Jesus Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have, we have peace. So understand this. Can that peace, that peace be interrupted? In reality, we interrupt our understanding of that peace. But no matter when I fall, no matter how hard I fall, I'm standing rightly clothed before God because I'm in his righteousness, not mine. And therefore, since you have this righteousness, how should you live? Should we live recklessly because, well, 
I'm a sinner and I'm going to keep falling, so I might as well just keep doing what I'm doing, you know. That's not the attitude that we should have. The attitude that we should have is that because I'm the righteousness of God, Lord, help me to live a life that is worthy. And how do we do that? Well, let's go to the Word of God. And I'm going to read something here that I believe will help us to understand just a little more about what God is telling us. It tells us here, and I'm going to change this version here. I just want to, okay. And I want you to listen closely now because this is so important. For when we ought to be teachers, you have need that one teaches you again, which is the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as need of milk and not of strong meat. He's saying, you should already be teaching the word of God. You should have in you the principles, the first principles of the word of God already established in your life so that you move from meat, excuse me, from milk to meat. But instead, he says, you're still drinking milk. For everyone that uses milk, he says, is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And this part really has always struck me because I have been in ministry for a long time. I, I'm 40 years. I have to say it's a long time. 40 years in ministry and seeking God in the word of God and wanting to know who he is. And how should I live my life since he has clothed me with his righteousness and that I am rightly clothed? How should I live? And so I realize in looking at many Christians and even leaders how reckless people can be, I said, I don't want to be that way. And I didn't know a lot about prayer. I didn't know a lot about the Bible, but I had one prayer that I believe God honored because he, I believe he put it in my heart. And I lifted up my voice and I said, Jesus, make me a healthy Christian. That's the only thing I could think about because I knew that health is important. So I wanted to be a healthy Christian. And when you pray a prayer like that, you better be ready because he's going to show you what an unhealthy Christian is. And the Lord began to reveal so many things in my life. You know, who wants to clean the, this closet? Wow. Who wants to go and clean this closet? I'll tell you who. The Holy Spirit. And I went through a series of all kinds of tests and trials and tribulations. I mean, you name it, just like you. And I realized that they are there to make us holy. They are there to strengthen us and teach us what is right. And how can we do what is right? Because you are rightly clothed with the righteousness of God. Do you know you cannot live the ultimate righteous life without the Spirit of God? And 40 years later, here I am still asking God to change me, still asking God to help me. But when I look at what God has done in my life and in my mind and the hunger that I have for him and the hunger that I have for the word of God and the hunger that I have just to walk with my, my beautiful Savior, just to, just to talk to him and just to let him love me and, and love on him, is, it's an amazing thing. And we're missing out on so much if we don't understand that this righteousness has clothed us rightly so that we can walk with God. And when I see the things that I don't do, and I go, I go back and I go, man, Lord, you have cleansed my life from so, so, so much. I know I, there's so, so much more. But when I look back and I don't have the same associations, I don't even look at things the way I used to, and I'm starting to say, I don't want to see that anymore, and I turn my head. I don't want to say that anymore, and I'm learning every day. See, that is what it means to walk 
in the righteousness of God. But you can only understand that in the word of God. And you want proof of that? He says, strong meat belongs to them who are full age. That means mature. Even those who by, by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern both good and evil. And that's where I'm finding myself more and more these last days is to exercise my spiritual senses through the word of God to know what is right and what is wrong before God. I see sometimes Christians doing, excuse me, doing things and I say, I can't, I can't do that no more. No, I can't. And you know who found himself in that situation? Is that clothes? Because it's just, uh, it's just so much food. Isaiah the prophet in chapter 6. He lived with the king, among the king, you know, the kingdom. They say that uh, King Uzziah was, Uzziah, was, um, Uzziah was his cousin or they were related. But whatever the situation is, he was a prophet, holy unto God. And at one point, God takes him from the natural and takes him to the spiritual. And here he is at the throne of God. I can imagine the excitement. I can imagine he was caught in awe and a vision. It was just tremendous. And all of a sudden, he sees the ones sitting on the throne. I don't know if he saw God in his fullness of who he is, but he knew that it was God sitting on the throne. He knew the person there was God, and he felt the presence of God because he saw it in the temple, and he felt the power of God when Things were shaken. I mean, it was an amazing experience. And at this point, after he experiences the, 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 the person of God and he experiences the presence of God and the power of God, he cries out one word that we know, and that is, woe, woe is me. I always tell people the Spanish, that is the, 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 the sense of, I like when you get burned and you go, ay, 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 ay. It was such a deep pain that he felt inside because he had knew, he knew that he was not living right according to the scriptures, according to the way of God. Because he says, I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. Here it is. You see, you see, Isaiah realized his condition when he saw God, not when he saw the people. And that's the only way you're really going to understand and see what the righteousness of God is when God takes you away from the things and the people that you know and puts you in the scriptures and you begin to cry out for his holiness. Well, I'm going to stop here. But know this. With God... All things are possible. You may say, I, I don't know if I can live that kind of life. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You say, but I don't know how to live that kind of life. Study to show yourself approved unto God. As one who does not need to be ashamed, but one who rightly divides the word of truth. Oh, but I don't know if my mind can take the change. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Oh, but the battle might just be so long and so hard. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we bring into captivity every thought to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are ready to do away with, to punish every act of disobedience once our obedience has been established. See, all these scriptures that I'm just quoting are the scriptures that we need to have in mind to fight the battle of righteousness against unrighteousness. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful, spirit-filled day. And remember, you are clothed rightly because you are rightly clothed. Ah, <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Until we meet again, shalom.